For this lesson we're going to continue our look at vectors and we're still dealing with some basic concepts of vectors. So in the last lesson we just took a look at some basic properties of vectors and definitions and so we're going to take it a little bit further here and we're going to start to get into some basic arithmetic operations but arithmetic as it applies to vectors. So we'll be looking at addition and subtraction today and for this one first thing I'm going to introduce is first the, the idea of addition and we're going to do that addition using what's known as the parallelogram law. If I start off with two vectors so I've represented them here a couple of different ways. I've represented them with points so I've got three points here A, B and C and I've chosen the first pair of points A and B I've decided to call that the vector A so you can see here the vector A is the same as AB and then I've taken the points AC and I'm calling that that's the vector B so when I add the vectors A plus B I'm taking the vector AB and I'm adding the vector AC but this is is in order to figure out what that actual addition looks like one way we can do this is what's known as the parallelogram law and the way that we do that is we form a parallelogram using the opposite side. So you can see A, B, and A, C make up the bottom left corner of my parallelogram. And then I take a copy of each of the original vectors. And when I join them up, you can see they all converge onto this single point, which I've labeled D. The resultant vector is this, this A, D. If I take this AB and I add a copy of AC, which is BD in this case, that's the path that gets me to D. Similarly, if I take AC and I add this green copy, which is labeled CD here, I also get there. So however I choose to do this, both of those paths both get me to the same place, which is D and then this blue vector is my resultant vector. That is my vector addition. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example. I've got two vectors A, B, and A, C and they have magnitudes of 4 meters and 5 meters respectively. So that means A, B, so let's write that here, that's telling us that the magnitude of A, B is equal to 4 and the magnitude of AC is equal to 5. And there is an angle of 120 degrees between them. So now I might want to go ahead and start to draw some things in here. So AB, I'm just going to draw a straight line there. I'm not going to worry too much about the, the measuring of things here. Uh, so that AB is 4 and then I've got AC with an angle of 120 between them so it's going to look something like that. So let's go ahead and label that. So we've got here is the point A and I said this was the point B so we've got AB has a length of 4 and so that would make that the point C and so AC has a length of 5 and we said that there was an angle of 120 degrees between them. So if we use the same principle that we did before, then what we're going to do is the parallelogram method is I'm going to take a copy of this, which I can do using technology. I can clone that and I'll move that up here and then I will clone this other side and I'll move it over to this side and you can see now I've got a parallelogram and my actual vector which I think I'll choose a different color for how about this is going to be from there to there so let's call that new point D so my resultant vector so first of all, my if I take AB and I add to it AC, then the resultant vector is what I've drawn here, which is 
AD. But I haven't been asked to do anything other than to find the length of AB plus AC, which in other words means if AB plus AC equals AD, then that means the magnitude or the length of AB plus AC is really just the length of AD. So now I have a geometry problem. This is no longer, we've done the vector part now. Now we move on to geometry. And so the question becomes, can I find the length of this side? Now, this was originally 4, which means this, of course, is also 4. This was originally 5, which means this is also 5. We had this 120 degrees, but this 120 degrees is now being cut by our new vector AD. But if we remember that this line is parallel to this line, if I look at this shape, let me uh, see here, I've got a highlighting tool. If I look at this part of the shape, that's a C pattern between two parallel lines. And so maybe that will jog your memory that this angle plus this angle has to add up to 180 degrees, which means that must be equal to 60. So what I did there, it's called the transverse parallel line theorem for um, interior angles here. So essentially I did 120 degrees plus the angle ABD must be equal to 180 degrees. So the angle ABD is equal to 180 minus 120 which is equal to 60 degrees. So that's where I got that from. So now what I'm actually dealing with here is a triangle. I'm just going to sketch it out here. Looks something like something like that. And the information that I have in this triangle is a 60 degree angle here, 4 here, 5 here, and over here is this side which we're calling the magnitude of AD. Now sometimes it can get a bit awkward dealing with these capitalized vector lengths, that sort of thing. If you want to relabel that as a length L for the time being, for example, if you want to say I'm going to let L represent that length, that's perfectly fine as well. But it's also worth it to keep in mind that you are going to be, in this unit, you're going to be using a lot of these vector representations. So there's something to be said for actually working with the notation that I've shown you there and learning all of the different ways that you have to represent it properly. If we take a look at this triangle, we actually have a cosine law question here. So the first thing I'm going to remind you of is the cosine law, which in general has the form a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine theta, where theta is the angle across from or opposite to the side a. So in our case, we have the angle here, and that's opposite to our unknown side. So that's good. We have all the conditions we need because we have the angle, we have B and C, and we are missing this side. So I'm going to go ahead and write it out now using the information that I have. So the way I write this is I say the magnitude of AD all squared is equal to b squared plus c squared. It doesn't actually matter which I call b and which I call c. So I'm going to say that's equal to 4 squared plus 5 squared minus 2 times 4 times 5 times the cosine of 60 degrees. Now that's a bit of a switch, 60 degrees. We haven't been dealing with degrees for some time. We're normally working in radians, but that shouldn't derail us too much. The cosine of 60 degrees, that's something that you should be able to come up with. You don't necessarily have to have it memorized. I don't worry about memorizing these things because I know I can reproduce my special triangles quickly and easily. So the cosine of 60 degrees is equal to 1 over 2 adjacent over hypotenuse. So the magnitude of AD 
all squared is equal to 16 plus 25 minus 2 times 4 is 8, 8 times 5 is 40. The cosine of 60 degrees, as we said, was equal to a half. So the magnitude of AD all squared is equal to, and I've got 16 plus 25 is equal to 41, minus half of 40 is equal to 20. So the magnitude of AD all squared is equal to 21. The magnitude of AD is equal to the square root of 21. And of course, the reason we can say that, we don't say plus or minus, because we know that the absolute value of AD, it's a length, must be greater than zero. And whenever you exclude or reject a value, you really should be making a note of, of why you are rejecting that value. And so that's it. There's our, our answer. How long is that side? Using the cosine law. Another way that we can perform vector addition, and it's, it's really the same as our parallelogram law. It's called the triangle law. It's just, it recognizes that we don't actually need to do both sides. We don't need to fully form this parallelogram. We really only need one side of the parallelogram, which makes a triangle. So the way that we do that is we take the tail or the starting point of our second vector. So if we're, if we're trying to do a plus b, then the way that we do that is we lay down our first vector, however we're going to do that. Quite often it's going to be a good idea. If you have the choice, then for example, if you're just drawing some vectors, it's a good idea to draw one of them on the horizontal and then to draw in the second one appropriately. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the tail of the second vector, which is here, and then we put that onto the head of the first vector, and we end up with this overall shape. And you can see this is the same as our parallelogram law, except for we didn't bother including this part and this part, but it is there, it is the same. Now this one, I've only drawn the vectors, or I've only represented the vectors using single symbols. So there are no points involved in this one, and you'll see both of those notations. Okay, so how about just putting these things together visually? So with the vectors that are provided here, how could I assemble these into A plus B plus C? So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to start with the vector A. Now this vector A has a position so I can't lay it down flat. I have to take it as it is. Now vector B, I have to take the tail of vector B and I have to put that on the head of vector A. So there's the next part. And then vector C gets added to the total as we've been going. So now I take the vector C and I add it to the head. The tail of vector C goes on to the head of vector B. And now that I've done all of those, my resultant vector is from this original start to the final ending point. Oh, the snap 2 is going to give me trouble here. That'll have to do. So that is my resultant vector. A plus B plus C. Those three together give me that resultant vector. And how about this one? 2A plus B. Now there's a couple of ways you can think of this. You can think of A and then you can think of 2. That's doubling it. But an even more simplified version of this is actually to break your 2A into A plus A plus B. Both of these are valid. And to do this, let's actually move all of this up here out of the way. And now we're going to take an A 
and we're going to take another a because I have a plus a and I line those up and then I take a b and let's see is this going to fit just barely and so my resultant vector is the sum of those three vectors or you can think of it of course as I said or you could think of this vector as a single vector which would be 2a if you're more comfortable with that but in either case we end up with our resultant vector which is 2a plus b so you need to be able to become comfortable with this both diagrammatically which is what I just showed you here or increasingly with algebra now this is an unusual one conceptually there's nothing mathematically difficult about it but conceptually this is one that trips people up which is the idea of the zero vector if we add some vectors together and the easiest way to think about that is taking two opposite vectors and adding them together but it could actually be a very complicated sum of vectors if I took a bunch of vectors and I added them together and the result ended up back where we started that would also be another example of the zero vector but the easiest way to get there is just to start off with one vector and then reverse that vector and add the two together and that is known as the zero vector because I started with a vector and so I've ended with a vector but it has a very strange property the fact that its magnitude is zero is not strange because if you think about that as a walking if I walk this way and then I walk back the same path what's the total how far am I from my starting point how far am I I'm zero away but the idea of the zero vector it also has no direction that's not the same as a scalar which just there's there's a scalar doesn't have a direction specified a zero vector has no direction that you can give it's a very strange and, and subtle difference between the two of them but the zero vector is a vector quantity so you can represent it this way and then you can talk about the magnitude of it as well when we perform vector subtraction because there's nothing saying that our vector equations have to always be addition the easiest way to, to think about this and it's not even if you're just new to vectors this is just the easiest way to think about vector subtraction is often to think about adding the negative vector so instead of thinking of a b minus c d I think of it as a b plus the negative of c d diagrammatically this makes a lot of sense to do it this way here's my vector a b to start and here's my vector c d rather than trying to figure out what is a b minus c d what I do is actually figure out what is negative c d all on its own which is this vector d c and then I perform the addition so this a b minus c d actually becomes a b plus the negative of c d but that's the same as a b plus DC and you can see that's what I have here here is a B and here is the vector DC and that's a simple addition to get my resultant vector here so really recommend that especially when you're doing diagrams but sometimes algebraically when you do a subtraction it might be more convenient to think of it as adding the negative and that's it another short lesson uh, these as I mentioned when we started this unit these vector lessons um, they may be familiar if you have a physics background and they're shorter because we're not covering really complicated concepts but they are new to a lot of people and so we need to give time for people to process these things